today. We've had some good news during the week. We have two new babies and we've got some photos to show you in a moment. But today we're asking the question, why do good people suffer? Well, we're going to be in our service with our first hymn. We did have a go at this a couple of weeks ago, but the singing group and Annette are going to teach us it. And after it, we'll pray together, and then we'll stand and sing together our next hymn, which is 128, and thank we all our God. So you might want to have that handy as well. The first one, though, God of glory, we exalt your name, the words are on the screen. Oh, 
this season of Lent intentionally, removing distractions that take our gaze away from your glory. May we quieten the noise that pulls us from you and puts our attention on lesser things. May we simplify where we have been stressed. May we surrender what has been burdensome. May we repent of what has been sinful. May we see your goodness and your glory in new ways. May we know the depths of your love for us more fully. May we not flinch from the pain you endured. And may we rejoice that you conquered evil when you rose to life again. In your name we pray. And they're a symbol of the hymn we're going to be singing in a minute, Trust and Obey. Because sometimes, as a mother, well, sometimes you just have to trust and obey. But there is a significant problem, I think. And it's the problem with mothers. And the major problem with mothers is that they see what they're not supposed to see. And they know about what they shouldn't know about. And they are able to predict what's going to go wrong before it happens. And it's incredibly frustration, frustrating as a teenager. So you have these great plans and the only thing that you hear is, have you got your vest on? <laughs> My mum would have been 100 this year. And uh, she died, what, 12, 13 years ago now. 
Uh, one of the stories I have told you is that um, Adolf Hitler objected to her baptism. She was baptised as a 16 year old in the river at Talawel. The chapel never had a baptistry. I was baptised into that church, but then we moved into the sea um, to, to have the services. But in those days, they dammed the river where there was a natural pool. And my grandfather was church secretary there because we go back a long way in that village. And he told me about the time of a January baptism when they had to break the water to frozen on top. And there were seven candidates being baptised that day, which may say a lot about their faith. Although I'm inclined to disagree, because I think it says rather more about the faith of the minister, who was there a very long time. In fact, the story goes that the doctor had gone past on his horse and made some derogatory comments about them being foolish. And the story goes, and I hope it's true, in a way, is that he was the one in bed the next day with a heavy cold. <laughs> Isn't life like that? But it is an adventure of trusting and obeying because you don't know what will happen. And so it's particularly nice for us to know that today we have got some good news. And there they are. <laughs> Eva Grace, Eva Grace Marsha, who is the daughter of Rona, who has only recently started coming to us, and who sits at the back of church. And underneath, and I'm not sure, is it Jonathan? Jonathan? I'm sure that Gellert and Emmy will tell us. But he was born, he arrived in the early hours of yesterday morning. And I think um, Eva... <laughs> I don't know if she's going to be evil, we said Grace, arrived on Wednesday. So uh, I shall thank them both because they're keeping teachers in work. <laughs> Trust and obey. And parenthood can be difficult, and we know it can. And we have friends that we know, for whom today is not an easy day. And we do think about that. In a moment, we're going to sing Trust and Obey, but I'm going to slightly change the order of service because the reading is about two parents who must have had quite a difficult time. Um, Elaine is going to read that, but you're going to give us the first part first, aren't you? So, and this is from John chapter 9. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of our reading today is taken from John 9, verses 1 to 25. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some wood with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam or wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Part two in a moment. Um, as you see, during this next hymn, we'll be taking up our customary offering. Thanks to everybody who does give to the upkeep of this church. Um, I know that many people uh, give by standing order, 
but when we pass the offertory plate around, if you want to make a gift, you can do through that as well. <coughs> we'll do that as we sing our next hymn, When We Walk With The Lord. It's number 548. <laughs> Father, help us to trust and obey as we serve you through these gifts and through our lives. For Jesus' sake. Thank all those that are helping in the delivery of today's service. Special thanks to Pam Smith and Marion for sorting out the Mother's Day flowers today. Uh, please 
join us for refreshments yeah, after the service, so that's when our fellowship continues. So, uh, quick reminder, um, there's baskets available in the porch for the help of uh, Christian aid because of the earthquake and disaster in Turkey and Syria, and also for the ongoing situation in Ukraine. So, uh, talking about refreshments, I've got a plea from Wendy. Uh, we need some assistance in uh, sorting out refreshments for next Sunday. So if you can help, have a word with Wendy afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, this coming week, on Monday, we've got uh, the 6 5 special lunch at 1 o'clock. On Tuesday, 9.30, we've got toddlers. 2 o'clock, the exercise group. 6 o'clock, exercise. And 7.30, the main group. Uh, they will be meeting here and see Lynn or Gwyneth if you wish to come. The focus this week will be on a concern that shows. Everyone is welcome to come to this. The first three sessions were very good. We'd like to extend the group, so please see if you can come. On Wednesday, we've got musical tops at 9.30 and brigades at 6 30. First, we have the toddlers again at 9.30. And on Friday at 10.30, we've got the Friday Fellowship Coffee. While we're talking about that, last week, uh, last Friday, we extended that uh, in aid of comic relief as well, and people were asked to donate. And by doing that, we raised a, a total of £349.35. Uh, and there's still a chance of increasing that amount because there's some cake available after this morning's service. So, like to have a piece of cake and make a donation, you know, so, so, so all proceeds will go to comic relief. Thank you. So, uh, this, Friday, this Friday is going to be a short ceremony at 1.50 in this church. There's a start the funeral of Sheila Hughes, who is a long time associated with the fellowship here. Probably that, there will be a benediction of departure followed by cremation at the established crematorium and the wake is at the house Owen Golf Club. Finally, a plea from Jennifer. We're organising an Easter Sunday breakfast. And Jennifer is collecting names for this. It's no fixed price for the breakfast, but, but, but we hope you will be making a donation. See Jennifer to book a place and the breakfast will start at 9.30. Uh, birthdays this week, Cara uh, Cooper, who's not here today, will be seven on Friday. And yeah, you know, sort of, yeah, just like to reiterate what sure it means this morning, sort of the birthdays of uh, Eva Grace to Rona and uh, Amelia and Jonathan to Gellis and Emmy. So, and this. Point. I think Phil would like to come forward and say a few words as well. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've come up to make an earnest, well, two earnest pleas to you for your support. We really do need your support for the two things I'm going to be talking about. I think most of you by now will have been given an agenda and various documents relating to a church meeting a week tomorrow. I'm saying this now and not next week because we, I'm not here next week. Uh, but most of you uh, should have received an agenda and papers for the church meeting a week tomorrow on the 27th. It really is a very, very important meeting. We need as many people there as possible, not just church members, it's an open meeting and a lot of what we've got to discuss that night will have a strong bearing on how this church moves forward. It really is vital that we have people there, it's extremely important. I'll give you notice now, we're hoping to have a Saturday morning event to further the debate that we'll be having a week on, on Monday. We need to really discuss what's happening with these buildings. So it is extremely important. Don't leave it to somebody else to decide for you. Come along and have your say, please. And a similar earnest plea, because two weeks time, two weeks today, 
will be Palm Sunday. Um, we've, uh, we did it last year with St. Peter's. We went for several years without doing this. We've traditionally celebrated Palm Sunday with St. Peter's. And uh, this is the second year back after all the lockdown business, etc. And the service in two weeks time will be starting at St. Peter's. And it will start at quarter past 10. And then those who are able will process from St. Peter's to here. But I'm rather hoping that those of you that are not able to process will also be at St. Peter's to start the service. And then come in your cars to here for the second part of the service. We don't ask this very often, and we don't do many joint services, but they are, when we, they happen, they are extremely important. We hope as many as possible will process, but we understand that a number of people can't process. But please make the effort to be there first, and then here second. Most of us have got transport to be able to do that. If you haven't got transport, see me and I'll make some arrangements so you can get from there to here. But we need everybody supporting you to both places. So please have a good think about that. It's for everybody. Thank you. And as Elaine makes her way up to continue the reading, um, perhaps I can uh, add a couple of things. Firstly, I've got to apologise because I didn't explain why Adolf Hitler objected to my mother's baptism. But she was actually baptised on the 3rd of September, 1939, when we declared war against Germany. So not only did he object to us building this church, because I think the first service here was on that day, but as my mother said, the prayers at church that night were very fervent. All of them were 16, 17 who were being baptised, and they didn't know what the future might hold, which is why trust and obey mattered so much. Let's continue our reading now. Thank you. Now, on the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it he can now see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how, but how he can na see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had, already, who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give God the glory by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do, don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Amen.
thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I was talking to someone about a speed awareness course they had attended, having been just over the limit passing a speed camera. They acknowledged that it had been a helpful course but also commented that everybody on the course was of more mature years. The speed merchants were notably absent. I'm not sure you can build a strong case on that, but it seemed unfair to them. And of course, the question about why the good suffer raises other questions, serious questions. Why do good people die too young? Why is a lovely family severely damaged by a life-changing accident or illness? And I'm not comfortable with a predestination idea that it's all part of God's plan. I can't accept that any more than I can accept the idea that God chooses particularly good people to be the parents of a child with a significant disability. I can't believe in God like that. I cannot discount the random nature of life, the good or bad luck, which can affect and afflict people. Why do good people suffer? One answer may simply be, who knows? But there is more to this, I believe. Let's begin on Mothering Sunday with the example of mothers. In the story of the man born blind, his parents have a surprising role to play. I don't know exactly what this particular mother in the story would have gone through, but there are countless stories through history of how mothers have shown care for their children by making so many sacrifices in times of war and famine. So often we hear stories about mothers who go hungry to feed their children. I googled heroic mothers, and saw the extraordinary stories of mothers who offered, often at great personal cost, unconditional love to their children. And there is little doubt that these parents of the blind man knew what it was like to have to make sacrifices for their child in a society which had no developed social care. And if both parents often make sacrifices for their children, we must focus on mothers, because I, as a mere man, acknowledge that the whole business of the birth of a child means men will never achieve equality with women. Of course, few mothers would ever claim to be perfect, and sadly, some families struggle painfully. But I don't believe I'm far out in suggesting that one way we understand why good people suffer is to look at the sacrificial examples of good mothers. And I suspect you agree, because you sang pretty wholeheartedly the words earlier on, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way. A second approach to asking why people suffer comes with another question. Who is to blame? The time of Jesus, and still today in many communities, there is the idea that suffering is related to past wickedness. Certainly in my work among people who happen to have a learning disability, for some faith groups from different parts of the world, there is the belief that a learning disability is a shameful result of past wrongdoing. Often the person with a learning disability was hidden from society, their presence acknowledged only within the family. In Birmingham still today, there is a much lower level of referral from some faith groups. Realistically, of course, some children may be disadvantaged by the bad choices of their parents. But in this Bible story, we see Jesus wants to challenge that attitude. 
Did you notice that the question is asked not by the usually negative Jewish leaders, but by his own disciples? It was a, a normal sort of question for them. This, this is a bad thing. This man blind from birth, so why? Who's to blame, him or his parents? Jesus has a different assessment of the situation. Let me show you something about the greatness of God, he says. Let me open your eyes to see God's presence in a special way. Let me throw some new light on things. For, he said, I am the light of the world. This does not mean that God caused the man's blindness. But however we understand the miracle, the situation was transformed by God's touch. Who's to blame? Well, actually, that's often a question we find ourselves muttering about. Even if it's a pothole in the, in the road, we come up with this great phrase, well, you'd have thought they would have done something about it. A question we ask so much in our present day, if there's a problem, and if we want to know why, well, cynic I may be, but let's get away from the where there's blame, there's a claim mentality. Jesus wasn't interested in whose fault he was, but saw that a solution was needed. I wonder if we need to refocus. Stop asking interminably who's to blame, who's fault, and work on the solution instead. Don't let suffering become a distraction. But it gets worse. Why do good people suffer? I think we've got another clue to that. You see, a selfish person actually has it easy. Look after him or herself. Look out for number one. Avoid problems by concentrating on just yours truly. Avoid unnecessary suffering. But if you're a good person, a person who's willing to put yourself out, to help someone else, willing to deprive yourself to make a sacrifice, then you will suffer. That was the mark of what Jesus did. We know that ultimately his suffering would be on a cross. And the irony was that he had to carry his own. And our Bible reading is a very clear example of how the religious leaders wanted him to suffer psychologically as well as physically. To smear him as a sinner. Smearing mud on someone's eyes to help someone is irrelevant to them. All they could see was not the extraordinary goodness of his actions, but that he'd broken the Sabbath. And, like a dog with a bone, they kept gnawing away at it, attempting to make the smear stick. The only mud they were interested in was simply to have enough to throw, because eventually it would stick. They try to deny the miracle. They interrogate the man born blind. They interrogate his parents, demanding to know if their son was really blind from birth. And then they try to trick the healed man. Did you spot that? The clever legal question. Effectively asking if he thought Jesus was a sinner. Because whichever yes, no answer the healed man gave, there would be bad news for at least one of them. In fact, the answer which John records was inspired. I don't know, said the man, but I'll tell you what I do know. I was blind, but now I see. If you read on, you'll see that they still kick him out of the synagogue, and the target on Jesus' back becomes even bigger. I don't think it's an impossible job to say that Christian people will experience the negative consequences of goodness. In our Lent study earlier this week, they're really good by the way, they, Gwyneth and um, Lynn have done a fabulous job of bringing this stuff together, I do recommend them. And they're all standalone, so you don't have to be into everyone before. 
but they are excellent Tuesdays, half seven. See you then. In the lead studies that we were looking at last Tuesday, we recognise that some people, critical of Christians, will denigrate them by describing them as do-gooders. Incredible. A positive statement that's turned evil. The press will search for flaws in the armour of people of faith to do them down. And because no one is perfect, they will find those flaws and proclaim them loudly. Ask Martin Luther King, whose indiscretions in some people's minds completely devalued his qualities, simply for being a human being. And Christian people suffer as well because others envy their peace of heart, their quiet acts of compassion. They may feel shame by their own selfish nature and opt to attack those dreadful do-gooders instead. Do thy friends despise for safety? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. What should we do? Well, you know the next line. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Example, mothers, who is to blame? Do good as despised? Well, that may help us understand a little about why good people suffer. But my conclusion is to ask what might these verses be saying to us? For some of us, there are times when we must confess that we have consciously avoided too much suffering by limiting the sacrifices we are prepared to make. Do we need to think again? And for some of us, we may find the whole thing necessary, but scary. We want to protect ourselves, perhaps because we've been hurt too much already. Take it to the Lord in prayer, maybe. In the long, dark, worrying hours of the night, don't count the sheep, talk to the shepherd. And for some, they already know what it's like to make sacrifices and see no reason to change. God bless you. And we should all be inspired what's going to happen in the next few minutes of this service when we gather around this table and remember how a good man suffered to bring salvation to the world. At this table, as we share the symbols of his sacrifice, each of us can connect with the living Lord Jesus to find guidance and courage. We prepare for that as we sing the first four verses of our communion hymn. My song is love unknown.
Do please be seated. <clears throat> we come to this table not because we must, but because we may. Not because we're strong, but because we are weak. Not because we have any claim on heaven's reward, but trust in God's mercy and righteousness to each one. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with them, and they with me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, for we are shamed by your goodness and confess our need of your forgiveness. But thank you because you welcome us and help us to begin again. We thank you for the truths of the bread and wine before us, and pray that as we receive them into ourselves, so we will receive you afresh into our lives, ready to commit, ready to make sacrifices, ready to love. Hear our prayer, as we offer it in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. We eat the bread as we receive it, a symbol of the loving Christ who comes to each one of us in our need. In the same manner also, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed with my blood. All of you drink of it. And for as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We retain the cup so that we can drink together, a symbol of our fellowship with one another and with our Lord. blood of Christ which was shed for you. Drink and be glad.
Father God, we give great thanks for being able to gather together on this Mothering Sunday. We are all conscious of the fact that our mums are the greatest unsung heroes we know. The influence they have on our lives is immense, and it's good that we are able to take this moment to remember them. It's also wonderful that in this very week we're able to welcome two new babies, Eva and Jonathan, into our church family. For some, this day is tinged with sadness, remembering those mums who are no longer with us or are struggling with ill health. Please, Father, remind us always to think of those in our lives for who there is support from us in times of need. Let us all show them our love and appreciation of what they do for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we know that many people are struggling with life at the moment. The cost of living, price of fuel, workers' strikes, all impact and make life more difficult. Let's take a moment to pray for those known to us who have grave concerns at this time. We all feel so helpless. We don't know what as individuals we can do. Then we ask you, Lord, to guide us so that the weak and vulnerable can be given the support they deserve and need. We thank you that there may be some progress being made, but pray that life may return to some kind of normality soon. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we despair that our world seems to continue to tear itself apart. Wherever we look, there are issues over freedom of speech, offending other people, intolerance and misunderstanding. It's frightening to think that even one year on, the people in Ukraine are still to contend with having their lives and families torn apart. We pray constantly for some ends to come and that the world will begin to come a more peaceful place. The issues we face are huge and we ask you, Lord, to guide our leaders to make decisions for the good of all. We thank you, Lord, for the good things in our lives and particularly in our families. It's all too easy to forget the joy of being part of a family and a family of God and the serenity that that can bring. Lord, we bring our thoughts and our prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy. Your own we finish with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever.
of our church meeting a week tomorrow. As we are in this church now, which we heat for just over one hour a week, one of the things that we will be looking at is whether we should be making better use of this part of the church in the rest of the week and what we might have to do to make that possible. Big question. So please make it a matter of prayer as well as attendance. And now let us go in peace to love and serve God. In the name of Christ. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, everyone.